uh, see administration in the we have three politics session today this is the first one and uh, uh, probably a busy day today can we have to discuss a lot of policy and uh, and uh, earlier any meeting the first is the SIG administration those who are regular here already familiar with that just to remember the process along with that those who are new just to know about how actually the policy development process in EPIDIC works. <clears throat> so our objective here to develop policies and procedures which relates to the management and the use of internet address resources by EPINIC, engineers and ISPs within the Asia-Pacific region. And uh, the first step to join the process is join the mailing list, six policy at EPINIC.net. Those who are not still there, please join there and participate in the policy development process. And if you want to know more about it, you can also look at the website, www.aptic.net slash policy dash SIG. And uh, we, have, uh, we have three, me, Shumon, Ahmed Sabir, Barton Sharia, and Ching Hen Koo are presently taking care of the chair role of policy SIG. And here are the steps of the policy implementation process. From the proposal submission to the implementation, uh, there is a, a long list of work we need to do. First, anyone can submit the proposal. And uh, first thing, it will go to the mailing list for discussion. And uh, after discussing in the mailing list, it will come to the policy meeting here. And uh, if any policy is consensus in this meeting, it will go to the members' meeting tomorrow, the annual members' meeting. And if it is conscious again, then we'll give another common period in the mailing list so that uh, if anybody have any comments on that, they can still raise the issue. And if it also passes the comments period without any objection, then it goes for EC endorsement. And then again, we get a editorial comment period. And then it's go for implementation. So it's a quite long process, but uh, we need to start with submitting the proposal and it go through all these processes. And, uh, and in this meeting, we have five proposals to discuss actually, and uh, that's from the mailing list, it came to the policy meeting. So this is the steps we are following, as per the guideline. And, uh, we need to reach consensus. It's not, I must mention that it's not voting. We need to reach consensus about a, it was a general agreement among all us, all of us, all the community members that, uh, and, and the consensus comes from, not only from this meeting, the comments in the mailing list, the feedbacks from this meeting, those who are participating remotely can also participate in, in it by sending mail. Even you can send mail now, even in the mailing list, you can uh, connect via YouTube or Adobe Connect and participate. And uh, we have a tool, we call it Confer, that you can connect and send your opinion via that. We'll, we'll, we'll show it shortly. And uh, in the consensus process, uh, there might be some objections, like the minor objections or major objections. The difference is that is if some problems may occur for some members of the group, uh, we call it minor objection, but a major problem will occur a part of the community. So, so based on if there's an objection, we'll uh, discuss together and we'll try to reach a general agreement on the policy. And uh, this is Confer for, we always welcome remote participation and for that this is a tool we're using for quite some time. And uh, we have some challenges on that and some comments on that. So we have another session, uh, short discussion on the Confer tool, how we can improve it, or whether we should be using it or not. But at present, chairs feels that uh, it's a good tool to gauge consensus from the remote participants. And you can log in it to confer.epic.net if you have already have uh, a Confer account, or if you're an EPIC member, if you have MyEPNIC, you can use that MyEPNIC account to log in to Confer. If you're not an EPIC member, you can, or if you're already registered to EPIC account in EPIC 46, you can use the same account to log in, or you can just create a new account to log in to confer. So those who are 
participate remotely or even here, you can try confer. And uh, if you want to know more about EPIC policy development process, you can uh, uh, look at our websites, look at the C guidelines. And uh, again, please, if you're not in the mailing list, please join in the, subscribe the mailing list now so that you can be part of the policy development process. And lastly, we, we have been discussing this proposal, Prop 118, almost for two years, and no need policy in the EPIC region, but uh, it didn't raise consensus in the last meeting, and back to the author, but uh, uh, so far there is no support in the mailing list on this proposal, and uh, author didn't submit a revised version, so we'd like to abandon this proposal. And that's from, the, from my side, and uh, thank you very much, and now, uh, I will ask uh, Sunny to write. Oh, it, it, it is George, right, to come up with the implementation of the proposal we have passed in the last meeting. Thank you, George. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Good morning, everyone. My name is George Adaji from APNIC. Um, I work in the member services area and also provide uh, policy support and SIG support during the conferences twice a year. Uh, today, I'll be giving you a brief implementation update for the recently endorsed policy proposal, Prop 125. This proposal was co-authored by Jordi Pallet martinez and Aftab Siddiqui. The current status, um, so I'll give you a bit of background. Um, the the proposal was submitted in August last year. Uh, it, was, it reached consensus at the Policy 6 session at APNIC 46 in September, and then it was endorsed by the APNIC EC um, during the EC retreat in December last year. Um, and then from the beginning of this year, the APNIC Secretariat started the planning for the implementation. Um, we've done our own impact assessment, and due to the complexity, we believe that it would be better to be rolled out in two phases. Um, we estimate the first phase to be um, implemented in June this year, and then the second phase would be rolled out in December later in the year. So for those of you who don't know what an IRT object is, it is an object in the APNIC Quiz database which contains contact information of network administrators that are responsible for receiving network abuse reports. This came as a result of the implementation of Prop 079 after the APNIC 29 conference. And thereafter, APNIC implemented mandatory IRT references on 8th of November 2010. The purpose of this proposal was to provide a more accurate and efficient way for abuse reports to reach the correct contact. I believe at that point in time, they only had admin C and tech C contacts, um, which were um, the only way for um, people to contact network operators and um, this was not necessarily the right place for network abuse reports to be reported. So I have some stats here. Um, so for all APNIC account holders, which include members and non-members, there are approximately over 10,500 IRTs, um, which are associated with over 13,000 email addresses. Um, out of those numbers, over 2,300 IRTs with over 2,300 um, associated email addresses are for non-portable customer assignments in the APNIC quiz database. Um, in 2018, APNIC received just over 3,000 invalid contact reports. Uh, this includes duplicates as well as complaints for unresponsive contacts. Um, so it's a rough figure. However, it indicates that we have a large number of invalid contact email addresses in the WHOIS database. Um, so we're quite optimistic that this policy proposal will reduce those numbers in the future and um, along with the efforts of in, um, improving the data accuracy. <clears throat> so going into the actual process um, from Prop 125, once APNIC initiates the validation um, process, two consecutive emails will be sent to all IRT objects associated with resources every six months. The first email um, will contain a, va a validation URL which will redirect them to an um, external website where the recipient will need to confirm to the recent policy changes, as well as um, read information about what's required of them to make sure that they monitor the abuse mailbox 
and ensure that they um, respond within a reasonable amount of time. The second email will then contain a unique code, which then they will need to put into the validation page. Um, and to ensure that it is a person that is actually valid validating, um, a capture code will be used to avoid automatic processing. I'm sure many of you have used um, a capture code on many common websites today. Um, so here we've got an example of APNIC's IRT object. So the validation emails will be sent to both the email and abuse mailbox attributes. Um, and if the recipient doesn't validate the email within the first 15 days, MyPNIC will display a friendly reminder asking them to update um, their IT contacts. If there's still no action after 30 days, then MyPNIC access will be limited um, and the user will be prompted to make those updates before they can use any of the other features. Um, this limitation will be similar to the way that we implemented the IT object and the organization objects in the, in the past. Um, in the whois, IIT objects will also be marked as invalid by adding to the remarks attribute. Um, and during this entire process, if there's not, no compliance from the member to update their invalid contacts, um, then we will follow up exhaustively um, and according to our current policy and procedures. Uh, so here you can see the remarks attribute in the IT object itself. This is the section that we will be marking as invalid. Um, there will also be a separate escalation process which will be available for anyone to report incorrect or lack of responses to cases of network abuse. Um, so APNIC um, plans to create a new escalation mailbox which will be monitored by APNIC. And once an escalation is received on our end, we will do our best to investigate and trigger a manual validation request to, to make sure that those contact details are either contactable or responding in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and similar to the validation process, if there is no compliance from the member, uh, we'll continue to follow up by contacting the member through all methods available. Um, and if there's still no compliance, then we'll escalate according to our existing policy and procedures. Uh, in Prop 125, they also ask that we create a new abuse C attribute in all parent who is records. Um, currently, LACNIC and RIPNCC have um, the abuse C attribute. We already have um, the main IRT, which has the same function, but um, what we'll do in this case is we propose that we um, point the abuse C reference to the existing main IRT. So next, we've got the implementation timeline. As I've explained, um, it'll be split, it, split up into two phases. The first phase will include only the validation of IT objects associated with the parent resource records and we'll also be creating the new escalation mailbox. And during the second phase of the project, um, which is due for completion in December, we'll also include non-portable assignments, which adds a level of complexity to the project, um, since many assignments or many members with customers also have multiple IRTs that are referenced. Um, and we'll also aim to resolve any issues that we encounter during the first phase of the project. So as an APNIC member, what do you need to know? Um, we recommend that you register for MyPNIC access and get yourself familiarized with the online portal. Um, we encourage you to read the policy and understand the upcoming changes that, are, that will impact you from this implementation. And we ask that you ensure your IT contacts are up to date and contactable and that you regularly, uh, regularly monitor network abuse, mailbox, and act on abuse reports where, ne where appropriate. Um, this will ensure that um, you'll continue to have MyPNIC access and we won't have to keep contacting you to update your IT contacts. Um, so that's it. I hope it was nice and short. Um, does anyone from the audience have any questions? Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Stiawan from IDNIC. Hi. Uh, so I have a question. For some countries, uh, Email is actually about a culture. So it's very common, like in Indonesia, mm -hmm. that people, they don't reply email. Yeah. But they will reply on WhatsApp or something like that. Yeah. So in a case when you, know, you send an email like every six months and they don't have a response, it's probably because part of, part of the culture. Mm. So is there any way, like, for example, you just 
put like another means to verify. Like, you know, because today, uh, like WhatsApp, they have bot. Mm. So you can just simply put a link, like a bot or something that can respond whenever they click the link and then, okay, I'm just simply replying that this is my, my real contact, something like that. So yeah, it's, it's just the case in, in, it's very common in, in, in my country that people, they don't reply email. Thank I you. I see, thanks for your question. Um, I think the main purpose of this is to make sure that that email address is contactable and that there's someone monitoring it. I think if we were to move it outside of that to say WhatsApp, it kind of defeats the purpose of making sure that someone, you know, it's not going to bounce back or someone's going to check that mailbox. So yep. um, I will take that into consideration for yeah. the Secretariat, but yeah, yep. I do believe the, the policy is quite clear with the intent. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jordi. I, I have a kind of answer to that as well. Oh, I please. commented already with my co-author, which after. Yeah. First, I think this is an operational issue. Mm -hmm. So despite what is in the policy text, if uh, APNIC believes there need to be other ways provided, I am fine with that. But the question here is not just the validation. Mm -hmm. Is other network operators need to send emails mm. which the log of what is the abuse. Mm. If they need to find the way for each country, for each operator, instead of using email, this one is using LinkedIn, this one is using WhatsApp, that doesn't work. Yeah, so I really understand the cultural thing, but the way to make as small automated as possible uh, reporting of incidents or abuse cases is send the log by email. Probably a machine will first read that and process that, and then maybe a human need to intervene. That's the spirit of the policy. Yeah. Thank That's, you. Thank you. Please. This is Sergio from Lagnik. Uh, as you mentioned, um, members have to authenticate to my APNIC portal to validate, right? But I would like to know if this process will include uh, to NIRs and how they are going to deal with. Um, I believe in the policy text it says it's optional for NIRs, no? Recommended, yeah. <clears throat> but in our region, um, some NIRs um, only have the NIR IIT. They don't have any for their members. So um, it would, I guess it would apply for those members that have IIT objects. Thank but you. It's thank recommended, you yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you for updating. And uh, actually, we have uh, re received a lot of uh, requests from uh, the law enforcement agency from many people to have the correct contact address in the who is contact. It's very important. So those who have who is contact, they should be a little bit more careful and out of the culture and respond to the mail. This is very important for the uh, running the internet smoothly. So it's not about culture. We must be careful about that. But of course, we can think about add some other means of communication as well in the future, maybe. Thank you. And thanks, Aftab and Jordi, for bringing this proposal. Uh, our next presentation is a modification of transfer policies, an informational presentation by Jordi Pallet. And probably it will come as proposal in the next meeting, maybe. Thank you. Actually, if I can make a small comment, we discussed it when we were talking about the BUC policy proposal with the staff, we discussed the NIR thing, and the problem is that uh, from the policy perspective, we cannot change that. It's something that I think there is an agreement with the NIR, so that should be taken in consideration in a possible modification of an agreement to make it mandatory for the NIRs. I think that, that was the conclusion we reached on top of my head, right? Maybe somebody from the staff can confirm it that way. Uh, Sunny from APNIC. Um, as uh, my colleague Odagi mentioned, if the IRT objects are maintained by NIRs, uh, they're subject to this policy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what is the idea of this uh, policy proposal? Uh, because I am active in, in all the uh, registries, um, I was working in, in a policy for transfers in, in uh, LACNIC and also in AFRINIC, and then I discovered that 
there is some text that from my perspective is not very clear about uh, some possible cases for transfers of uh, IPv4, IPv6 and ASN. So I, I, I was thinking, okay, I, I need to suggest also a similar change in APNIC. So the thing here is that the existing uh, policy for transfers in uh, IPv4, IPv6 and uh, ASN um, in the region make uh, a special case for uh, mergers and acquisitions, but the text is not clear. I am going to, to skip some of the slides and, and go to the, to, the, to, the, to the most important thing. So the text is not clear uh, what happens if, for example, part of a company is purchased by another. And what happens if that is happening not inside the same region, but in different regions? Okay, so it's, I am referring to cases of not just mergers and acquisitions, but per partial mergers or acquisitions, some divisions of a company. Maybe a company has a network and data centers and maybe selling only the data centers. And maybe those data centers are moving from one region to another because it's cheaper. Or maybe they have more customers in another region. And that may happen if uh, that's coming into APNIC or going outside of APNIC. So it can be in both directions. Um, there, there is a variety of texts on these regards in different regions. So in some regions, there is more or less support for this or more or less clear text regarding that. So what I am suggesting is in the three uh, parts of the policy text that we have right now in APNIC, uh, one of them is 8.4. 8 uh, in, in the slides, you will see in the left the existing text, which is small uh, leather uh, size, and bigger size in the, in the right, uh, what I am proposing. And uh, most of the time, I'm trying to, to, to highlight with red color the text that I am actually changing. So the existing policy in this section, 8.4, talks about mergers uh, and acquisitions, and I am saying mergers, acquisitions, and relocations. Uh, and then, the existing text says more or less APNIC will process and record the transfer of IPv4 resources as a result of a merger and acquisition, and I am changing that as partial or complete merger, acquisition, reorganization, or relocation in both cases inside the region and which other registries. Okay, so that's the change I am proposing. So it's, I think probably if this comes to the table to the staff, they will allow it, but I think it's better to have that text very, very clear uh, stating that. So in the case of IPv6, there is a similar situation and a similar text. So again, I am having there a modification that says parser or complete, and instead of just merger and acquisition, I am talking also about reorganization or relocation, and again, I mentioned the cases for both inside the region and which other regions. And finally, exactly the same for ASNs. Okay, I am not going to repeat it, but it's the same text. So I think that was that, yeah. No impact, no changes, some reference from either other regions. And in case of any discussion, I am going to keep in the screen one of the, the texts that I am proposing. But basically the change I think is making clear that it's not just a merger and acquisition as a whole, but it may be part of a company, or it may be a company moving from one region to another, and so on. Thank you. Any Question? comments or suggestion for the discussion? After? Craig. Uh, hello, Craig Ng, APNIC General Counsel. Um, your policy text does not um, take into account where there are no inter-RIR transfer uh, policy between different RIRs. So what happened in that case? Because this is, we all recognise, um, so there are some where you can't transfer to another RIR. Uh, I am not modifying that. So... My understanding that if this is a merger and acquisition, it will depend on what is in the other region as well, right? So I think that's 
the, the existing situation with, with the actual tax, not changing that. If the other region don't allow the transfer, you cannot do that. That's clear, right? Yeah, well, I guess that's the assumption and I'm simply pointing out. So exactly. you might want to think about some clarifying text, you know, provided there are compatible RIR. So, RI so you are suggesting we should add if, in the case of uh, inter, uh, inter RIR, in the case is allowed in the other region. Yeah, okay. exactly. We can do that, no problem. All right. <clears throat> Aftab Siddiqui. Um, I, my question is more towards Secretariat um, asking um, if, if any um, transfer was stopped because there was a partial merger or acquisition scenario in this, in this case. If, if something was blocked just because it wasn't a full uh, merger or acquisition from one entity to another. If, I mean, just trying to understand if this is a problem Anyone from Secretariat? After, from my perspective, while they go to the mic, I understand that partial or complete, probably it's not a problem right now, but what about the relocation? No, I totally, I totally understand that, but I'm okay. just trying to understand the first part, if it was blocked so that we have to look at from, I mean, we have to take a step back first and then look at the problem. So I just trying to understand if it was blocked by Secretariat uh, in the past or not. Got it, thank you. George from Epinic. Uh, I don't believe we have blocked any partial M&A transfers as long as they've provided the legal documentation um, also to demonstrate that there is a partial transfer of network infrastructure, then I don't see a problem with that at all. Does that answer your question, Laftab? Yeah. Any more questions or comment? I have a, just a explanatory question to Jody that uh, uh, if we do not add this text, apart from the clarity to the Secretariat, any other challenges you see here? Sorry, if? Apart from the clarity for the Secretariat that uh, these are the condition, we can, we can do that. But do you see any other challenges uh, may occur in future? I, I think it's just clarifying okay. something that probably under the understanding of the Secretariat is obvious, but I think it's important that we have as much as possible clear text in the policies because somebody will, willing to do this kind of uh, exercise is going to read the text. If he believes that his case is not included, he may take two actions. Either go to the secretariat and ask if that will be allowed, or don't do it, or lie. So I am trying as much as possible those situations if we have a more clear text. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jody. No more questions? No more questions? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. So we'll move to our next presentation. It is uh, from Jeff Houston. I don't, s oh, he's here. So Jeff will be talking about uh, unadvertised addresses. Morning all, um, this is actually an informational presentation came up in discussion within the Secretariat some weeks ago and uh, we were asked to uh, have a look at unadvertised addresses sitting within APNIC's registry. So this presentation is precisely focused on that subject. Um, this graph is the total status of the IPv4 address space since the year 2000. The blue line at the top tracks the total number of IPv4 addresses that has been passed from the IANA pools into the collective RIR system. It encompasses the legacy space that was also handed out before the inception of the RIRs. The green line is the total span of addresses that we saw in BGP. Now, various folks see various things. 
this is one view of BGP, other people's views might change a little, but you know, at this level of detail and the distance you are from the screen, it's pretty accurate. Uh, the span on the left, the unit is in slash eights. So we're currently advertising, geez, I need my glasses, 168, 169 slash eights in the routing table. The red line is the line that is the difference between the green and the blue. So it's the unadvertised address space. And as you see, it started in 2000 at around 30 slash eights or the equivalent thereof, and has slowly risen uh, to a peak at around 50 in 2011 and has come down ever so slightly. We're now sitting at around 49 slash eights unadvertised. Um, so 23% of the address space I can't see in BGP, and you can't see it there either. This is a look just at that red line with the vertical scale blown up. And what you actually see is we peaked at around 2011, and since that time, the amount of unadvertised address space has more or less declined. Uh, and a lot of this has something to do with the post-exhaustion market where there has been a certain amount of uncovery of unused addresses that were not being used and a recycling of that back into BGP one way or another. But that reflected the entire system. So now we can take the individual statistics produced by each RIR and do exactly the same thing per RIR. Um, 35 slash eights sit inside Aaron's registry and because Aaron still has the bulk of the legacy, the pre-RAR allocations, where things happened way back in the days of the internet, it's perhaps not surprising that there are so many unadvertised addresses sitting inside their registry. Um, both the RIPE NCC and APNIC have approximately 12% of their address base sitting as unadvertised in their registries, and LACNIC and AFRINIC at around 8% or so. So RIPE and APNIC, much the same kind of numbers. Here's the changes since 2016 for each RIR. So in Aaron's case, fascinatingly, it dropped for some years until late last year when all of a sudden the amount of unadvertised address space rose quite dramatically. Uh, perhaps because of an address transfer. In fact, I know it is because of an address transfer that hasn't been advertised yet. The green line, though, is APNIC. Uh, and oddly enough, in APNIC's case, since 2016, in the last three year, two years, uh, the unadvertised address pool has grown by some five million addresses. That's grown, not shrunk. Um, Here's a more detailed look at the same thing, where the green line is the unadvertised space, the gold line is the advertised space, and the blue line is the APNIC pool. You will notice in, uh, geez, around uh, mid last year, a massive jump. Um, an entity uh, called Ali Cloud, which is registered in Singapore, uh, transferred a slash 10 and a slash 12, which is quite a large pool of addresses, into APNIC, and that has not been advertised as yet, which is why you see that quite dramatic step function in the size of the unadvertised pool in this region. Um, in APNIC in particular, we have a little under a billion addresses, 880 million addresses, 770 million are advertised, and simple maths will tell you that the reserved namely 110 million, we can't see in BGP. I should note that also the APNIC system reserves addresses. I won't go into the details. I'm sure you can ask the registry folk exactly what's going on, but there are 4.4 million addresses in the APNIC registry that are neither marked as available nor marked as unavailable, allocated. They're marked as reserved. They're outside these numbers. So let's just have a look at these 110 million addresses to find out how old they are. Is this part of the original 1996-97 um, sort of legacy that APNIC inherited? 
or are these more recent? So this is an interesting cumulative distribution of the age profile of addresses. So what we can see in the blue line is that APNIC started 25 years ago with less than five slash eights. And you can see that exponential rise in the blue line up to around eight years ago, which is the age of the advertised address base. Uh, more than half of the addresses in APNIX registry were allocated in the four years to run out, is what that blue line is showing. The red line is the unadvertised space, and that's an entirely different trajectory. A huge amount of unadvertised space is actually quite old. Let's normalise that and talk about percentages. So this is exactly the same graph, but now it's 100% rather than the actual number. So if we take the exhaustion point, sorry, 12 years ago, 50% of the unadvertised addresses in APNIC are more than 12 years old, slightly less of the advertised addresses. And around about 38, 39% of addresses are more than 22 years old, which sort of dates pre-APNIC. So there's a large number of addresses inside that advertised pool that quite frankly APNIC was never really allocating in the first place. They existed well before. The next graph is similar, but rather than looking at the original allocation date, I'm looking for the period that I've never seen it in BGP. So there are 6.5 slash 8s that I can't see in BGP. Um, around about 1 slash 8 I saw in the last two years. So, in other words, 5.5 slash 8s I haven't seen for the last two years or more. Uh, for the last four years or more, about 4.8. Six years or more, around four slash 8s. And interestingly, about three and a half slash 8s I have never seen in the last 12 years. In other words, there are long-term unadvertised that have never been announced for a significant period of time. So here's a quick breakdown of that. 10% of the unadvertised addresses were last seen in BGP within the last year, and 55% haven't been seen for more than a decade. They are very, very old unadvertised addresses that we've never seen being used actively in the public part of BGP. Where are they? That's an odd question because where is always a tough question for us. Is it the place where the organisation is registered and has its postal address that we mark as a country? Or is it the country where the various geolocation databases last saw that address being used? This table uses the registration code, the country where we think that entity lives or that entity told us that they reside in. So of that unadvertised address pool, 39 million addresses are located according to that system within China. You can read the rest of this table as well. That's ranked in order. China, Japan, India, Singapore, Australia, Korea, Indonesia, Taiwan, etc. If I use the MaxMind database, which is actually the country where we last saw those addresses according to MaxMind. Now, MaxMind is not truly accurate. There are errors. Uh, but it is a subtly different view. And you notice now that a pool of addresses that we register against Singapore, MaxMind think is in the United States of America, and there's a total pool size there of 5.7 million addresses. Um, that's AliCloud. The last time those addresses were used pre-transfer was in America, so MaxMind called them American. So. I call them American, whereas in reality, we're now calling them Singapore because that's where they got registered. So most of this data is much the same, but there are a couple of anomalies because of these differences in geolocation. Um, some closing observations. Um, we can't see 110 million addresses in BGP. That's 12% of the total amount of address space under APNIX stewardship. 30% um, of that pool was allocated or assigned by APNIC in that three-year run-up to pool exhaustion, so that's in the period 2008 to 2011. 
10% of the unadvertised pool is due to recent transfers that we haven't seen being advertised, including that slash 10 and slash 12, and 30% is way old, and that actually includes those pools of addresses that got passed into APNIC from the Australians and the New Zealanders, which occurred before 1999. Um, some notes. I just used the data published by APNIC. There's no secret data here. If there is, so I'm not a party to that secret. Um, if the address block is listed in the transfer log, I use the date of the transfer because that seemed the appropriate date to use rather than the allocation date. And as I mentioned earlier, I have not included the reserve blocks. There are 1,282 blocks marked as reserved, which, as far as I can tell, if my addition is correct, is 4,423,680 addresses, which is about a slash 10. And my BGP feed is 131072. Yours is different. It might vary, but only cosmetically. The rough answers are much the same. Any questions? Any comments masquerading as questions? Uh, Guang Liang Pan from APIC Secretary. Jeff, I uh, just want to clarify your point about 4.4 million IPv4 research. So this is a comment? Yeah. Yes, this is oh, a comment. It's not yes, a question, sorry. it's a comment. <laughs> not a question. I just want to ex uh, clarify what is that. Uh, there are those recanted historical IPv4s. And for the legal point of view, we are not uh, delegate them at this stage. That is why market reserve is not available for delegation for the time being. Thank you. As I said, I, I, I didn't include them in the analysis because we are holding them for whatever reason. You just heard the reason. Yes, Great. yes, of course. Thank yeah. you. That's the correct data. Thank you. Bajesh uh, Jain, Geoff, uh, how many IP addresses are not in the RIA registry system at all? This is some number earlier thought to be about 20%. Uh, and in the table you have said in the table number one, encompassing legacy, encompassing means including? So in, in some ways I suppose your question makes no sense. I, I no, no. <laughs> what we actually do is take all the numbers from 1 to 4.4 billion, 1 to 2 times the power of 32, and we allocate them a location. Now, there's only six possible places where they could ever be. They're in either one of the five RIRs or they're with the IANA. The IANA have their own registry of address pools that they own and they have an IETF maintained registry of special use addresses. So, if they're listed in either of those, it's IANA. All of the other addresses are in one of those five RIRs. So they're either in one of six locations, there is no seventh location. Every address is included in this analysis. Thank you, but Thank you. if you permit me to, to ask an additional, uh, out of those addresses which are with IANA and not with the five RIRs, what percentage appear in uh, BGP? What percentage of those addresses held by the IANA are appear in, in the BGP tables which we see? Um, if you're announcing net 10, I will see it in BGP. It's in the IANA table as a special use address. You shouldn't really be, but I see it. Um, there are a number of other special use addresses that have a legitimate role in, in, in BGP. They are very small. Other than that, I get rid of what we call bogons. So if you invent one of the few remaining addresses that is held in the IANA pool, or using one of the special use addresses that you shouldn't be using, it's, I don't count that. That's a bogon. You're doing something bad, and I'm not pulling you in my counting list. Sorry. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Aftab Siddiqui. Hi. Uh, so you answered the bogon part. I just wanted to clarify if bogons are part of that list or not. So that's clear. Second point I have is uh, just, try, just trying to understand uh, the pattern that is there any correlation between transfers and 
rise of unallocated, uh, I mean. You know, I had optimistically thought, like you, that transfers should have been mining the unadvertised address pool. And there was some evidence on this slide that globally, since exhaustion, that unadvertised pool was getting smaller. And obviously transfers are helping to do that. But when I looked really hard at APNIC, which is the green line in amongst all that mess, oddly enough, since 2016, it's risen by half a million addresses. And so at least for APNIC, transfers aren't necessarily being effective in recycling what we think are addresses used or possibly unused, but used in private contexts. So in our region in recent years, it hasn't been that effective judging by that data alone. That's a pretty qualified answer, but you know, that's where the data leads us. Okay, so I don't know if it's just, just uh, too optimistic to even ask this question. The thing is, if, is there any correlation to figure out if just, okay, so for me is just advertising in the aggregate doesn't mean anything, right? Um, if Ali Cloud transferred one address space of slash 10 or slash 10 plus slash 12 and started advertising it, is there any way to figure out are they even using it or not? Um, as a registry. I mean, I understand that. It's, as it's, as it's a registry, the, yes. rather than a transit network provider, and indeed rather than a massive cloud service provider, and you can name them as well as I can, we have no direct way of understanding traffic and understanding source and destination addresses. So while your question is interesting, from my desk and my legitimate bounds of vision of the internet, I cannot answer you. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chair. This is Gowei. Um, I Is that possible? Those of, of course, um, I'm not talking about a big chunk of the block. But is it possible a block of the unadvertisement actually is uh, the people using for the private intranet and you cannot detect that from the BGP? Oh, totally, Kuo Wu, totally. Our policies have always said, and I believe, someone correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. that when I apply to APNIC for addresses, even in V6 today, I do not necessarily have to use those addresses on the public internet. Mm -hmm. That's up to me. Yep. If I choose to use them in any other way, as yes. long as I can say I have legitimate use of them, I will receive an allocation and be listed in the registry. Yeah. So I am not in any way questioning whether these are being hoarded, okay. stashed away, unused. That's okay. not the issue. Okay. All I'm doing is yeah. describing these are this the ones scenario. we can't see in BGP yeah for whatever reason, yep, of course. and this is where yeah. we last saw them, we think, <laughs> that's all. Yep, yep, Great. that's good, Thank you. If there is no more question, thank well, you, Jeff, and, uh, and uh, it's a very interesting information we have got today, actually, that uh, there's a large amount of address not advertised into BGP, so I think we need to do more work on that, if we can figure out that if they're sitting idle or using privately, get, if we get more information, then when we can see further policy development, actually, that uh, how can we bring I, that I, in use, if they're unused, really, I don't know. My point, I suppose, is from the registry side of things and from the RIR, we cannot legitimately determine their context of use if they are being used in private. That's just none of our business, and we can't see our vision doesn't go beyond the wall. So, you know, beyond that, it, it's honestly up to someone else. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, Mr. Shanjay, you want to make any question or comment? Uh, no. <laughs> Should we hold Jeff or? <laughs> no, no, you, <laughs> thank Jeff, you, can, Jeff. Jeff can go down. I, I just want to uh, say that uh, uh, the last uh, survey, uh, member survey uh, said that for the secretary to look at this uh, unused address space and then see if we can reclaim it or something. So it's in our uh, uh, plan this year to, do, to look into that. No promises, but we will look into that and see you know, what can be done.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shenzhou. Okay. Um, now we're going to have the author of the five proposals to be discussed during these sessions to have a quick presentation of their proposals. Um, Jordi, do you want to start? Thank you. Actually, this, uh, this year, actually, we tried to add this additional opportunity so that uh, the, uh, the audience actually can get an opportunity to think about the policy so that uh, after readout, we have get some time in the tea break, we can discuss with the author or we can discuss ourselves what the impact of the policy. And uh, uh, Jody, I hope you will be brief and quick to just to explain why you propose the policy and what's the impact okay. and what's the benefit? I am, I am still a bit confused about this part of the session. So if, if I do something wrong, shut, shut me down, no problem. Um, I think, I'm not sure if finally you decided to present something or not. No. Okay, so I will start with uh, proposal one to four. What I am trying to do is not actually reading the policy text or the policy proposal text, but trying to explain why I am proposing that proposal, right? So the first one is proposal one to four. Uh, we are actually in the version number five, so it has been around for one year or one year and a half, I don't remember anymore. Um, the reason I propose this is because in RIVE we had a situation where community networks, and that started a long time ago in 2016, if I recall correctly, uh, community networks uh, offering uh, wireless hotspots, free services, uh, they could not get a space from the RIPE NCC because according to the policy text, uh, it's basically they are not using that addressing a space for themselves, but for third parties, so the, the guests of the hotspots, okay? So after two years, it was a long discussion, it was approved in RIPE, and then I decided to look at that policy text in all the other regions, and we had the same problem in every region. So basically what the politi policy text that we have today is saying is that if instead of getting end user space for your own infrastructure, you are using that for third parties, for example, uh, guests in, in a company or visitors or students in a university or as, as I just said, a uh, hotspot, an open hotspot, you are not allowed to provide sub assignments of the space that you, get, you got from APNIC as an end user, okay? Um, in addition to that, if you look to, for example, point-to-points, point-to-point links, you may see that one side of the point-to-point -point is inside your infrastructure, inside of your network, but the other side is not. If you look into VPNs, you have the same situation. If you look into data centers, and I mean not that a data center for your own company, but a data center offering services to uh, for hosting or housing, you have the same situation. So, because we had this problem in another region and I discovered that we have the same situation in other regions, I said, okay, let's try to fix in the same way. Let's try to make the text clear to let uh, know the, the people that if they are getting addresses as end user, they also will be able to use those addresses, for example, for a hotspot, okay? So that's basically it. This uh, policy has already passed in ARIN. There was a comment from one of the AC members that, of course, they changed the text. It was not the exactly same text I submitted originally because in, in uh, ARIN, the PDP is different and the AC takes over the outer text to, 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 to get the proposal uh, until the end. Uh, and uh, today uh, is also the last day of the last call for the same policy proposal in Afrinic. 
So unless there is now a bunch of, no, no, let's not do that, today this will be also effective in Afrinic. So we have RIPE, Aiding and Afrinic, and I hope that uh, LACNIC, that uh, I am proposing again the same, according to the last discussions in the list, I hope that will pass also in the next meeting. So I'm not sure if that was the intent of this session, if I turn correctly or not. Yeah, it was mainly to, to clarify the goal of your proposal. Okay, not going into the details. So questions, or you are open to questions now? No, 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 no question, it's okay. just a presentation. So just Thank to you. discuss on the break. Okay. Uh, next might one. Well, might as well do the, uh, the, the other ones as well. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse I, me, I need to, to remember each one because I don't have all of them in my, in my head right now. So next one is one to six. It's in version three. This is PDP update. Basically what happens is, um, while I am active in, in all the regions with the PDP process, and, and um, from that perspective, I see good and bad things on, on every region in the PDP process. So I, I saw some aspects that in LACNIC we accepted as a policy uh, a change for the PDP one year ago, if I recall correctly. And I thought, hey, uh, we have a similar situation here in the region. And the main aspect is, well, there are two main aspects. One is the PDP is for the community, not for the membership, okay? So for me, it don't make too much sense that after the community accept a policy proposal, after it reached consensus, we have an intermediate step, which is the membership accepting that or not. Because that can be done also by the endorsement or non-endorsement of the AC, and of course, there can be also a call by the members to say, hey, we need a vote if the AC don't have a clear view. So having so many steps for the approval uh, after it got consensus, understanding that there is also a last call where everybody can comment and say, hey, this is broken because this and that and that. Don't make sense to me. So that's one of the aspects that I am trying to make it simple. Not, uh, not facilitating, let's say, that the consensus of the community can got shut down by the membership unless there is a very clear impact on the membership, which that will be then rejected by the AC, okay? But I don't think we need to repeat the same again so many times, let's say. Now, the other aspect is, I know, and it has been mentioned this morning at the beginning, that even if the PDP says that the consensus is in this meeting, you are heading the community in the mailing list. But the PDP don't say that. And from my perspective, it must be very, very clear. If we want to have an open approach and everybody is contributing, is able to contribute, we need to make sure that the people that has the chance to speak in the mailing list but not come here, they understand that their comments in the mailing list are important and are relevant and are part of the PDP, because you could perfectly not hear the comments in the mailing list and you are following the PDP. So it's nothing against you, of course, but I think that if we really are hearing the mailing list and we want to be uh, not discriminatory against the people that is not able to come to every meeting, we need to say that in the PDP. So that's basically it. I hope it's, it's, uh, it's clear now. Next one? Yeah, uh, make it short. <clears throat> okay, so proposal one to eight. Uh, Multi-homing not required for ASN. There was already uh, a change on this part of the policy, uh, which I think it was proposal 114. Uh, and the original intent, if you read all the conversations of that pro proposal, 
the original intent for that proposal was exactly the same I am trying to make it here. So is there are situations where you may want to get an ASN and you are not able to be multi-home. Or maybe you think you will be multi-home, but you don't know when. And that when may be three months, but maybe three years. Maybe you don't have in a remote location an independent or a different ISP to get your transit, okay? So the actual text of the policy is saying, if you say that you will become multi-home, that's good. But that's forcing people to lie, or at least open the possibility to that, because the, the, the actual text is not saying you need to do that in that term of time, okay? So I think we should have, as I explained it already before, we should have clear text that is not facilitating the people to lie. It's better if we understand that there are cases where you are not multi homed but you really require an ASN, let's allow that clearly. There was a comment in the mailing list saying, hey, but then we are facilitating people requesting ASNs without the need. I don't think that's going to happen. The actual policy text also says that you need to have a previous space, I'm, I mean addressing a space. So that actually are, is forcing you that if you are a newcomer, you go, request a dressing space, wait a few seconds, and then get the ASN, that don't make sense. You want to get it instantaneously at the same time. I know, it's, it's, it's something that the staff can understand, and they will not probably turn down a, a request if it's too much close to the IP request, but it don't make sense to me to have that disqualification in the actual text. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. <coughs> Um, Aftab, do you want to present Ching? Uh, Tim. 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 Tim? For the 127? Yep. Aftab will go next. Sorry. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Tim from TTAM Nick. Uh, today, I will uh, brief, uh, introduce the uh, proposal 127, and so that be everyone can discuss uh, during the break time. Uh, currently, the APNIC member could get maximum slash 22 IPv4 address from the 103 slash 8 pool, uh, but the remaining address uh, in this pool is the less and less. Uh, so, uh, we propose to change the maximum delegation size. Uh, from the stretch 22 to stretch 23. So it can uh, prolong the exhaustion time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And for the last one, um, Aftab, please. The abolishing waiting list. Hi, everyone. Um, Aftab Siddiqui. It's proposal 129, abolishing the waiting list uh, for the unmet IP4 request. Um, as per the policy, currently, uh, any, any new member can only get a slash 22 address space from last slash 8. But uh, there's another policy which says uh, there will be a waiting list where you can get up to a slash 22 address space from the IANA recovered or APNIC recovered uh, address blocks. So the waiting list was created a couple of years ago. Um, and at the time of writing this proposal, the list, uh, there were 658 members mm -hmm. in that list. And today, I checked it, there are 697 members in that waiting list. The waiting list is growing pretty fast. Uh, the allocations are drying up uh, from the recovered address space. Uh, IANA gave three slash 22, uh, the whole uh, three slash 22 in 2018. APNIC recovered around, um, APNIC recovered some address space and allocated to, to uh, the members in the waiting list. So there were 118 allocations in 2018. So list is growing with a very uh, fast rate, but there So I guess uh, we can, 
for yeah, we can go for a break, have a decent, very hot coffee. And uh, I'll see you all hopefully in 30 minutes. Thank you all. Take, take advantage of the break if you have.